Let's talk about Hamlet, or more specifically, Omlev, the old Norse story that serves as the literary ancestor of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, the play many of us were required to read in high school. Yes, some tales have a tendency to reemerge re again and again over the ages. Now, we love a hero's journey as the basis for many of society's most loved tales. From Star Wars to The Wizard of Oz, Harry Potter, The Lord of the Rings, The Matrix, and even closer to our subject of today's review, The Lion King. Today we're he we are discussing The Northmen. Hi, I'm Rob, and this is A Constantly Racing Mind. Every now and again, a new film emerges from the ruins of cinematic remakes, reimaginings, and rehashings of a particular property. Now, I remember back in 1994 when The Lion King first came out. Now, I'm not much into Shakespeare with all the these and thous of the Queen's English. That's Elizabeth I, not the current monarch who just turned 96 years old recently. Now, plays like Romeo and Juliet have been reimagined many times more recently, films like Warm Bodies from 2013, Ophelia from 2018, and even Christian Bale has had played this part in the, the Prince of Jutland, now called Royal Deceit, in 1994. And there are way too many more renditions to mention even here. Now, like Romeo and Juliet, which was based on an earlier poem or, or story by Arthur Brooke, but the story is even older. Then there's the story of Beowulf, which has also been retold many times. Now, my favorite version is Outlander, starring Jim Caviezel in the science fiction version of the old English epic poem from 2008. Check it out, but I digress. Now, The Northman is a screenplay developed by Robert Eggers. You know, the guy that wrote and directed the creepy surrealistic The Witch in 2015, and The Lighthouse, a somewhat Lovecraftian take on madness from 2019. You will see how some of these films have influenced his casting choices in the film and probably others in the future. His co-writer, Sjorn, is an Icelandic author known for Lamb from 2021. Now, Alexander Skarsgård, you know, the son of Stellan Skarsgård, was also instrumental in the development and is the star in this film as Amleth, the son of the king, Arvindvel, War Raven, played by Ethan Hawke, and Queen Gurudin, played by Nicole Kidman. Danish actor Klaus Bang plays Fjellnor, the brotherless Amleth's uncle who, spoiler alert, kills Amleth's father, marries his mother, and steals his kingdom. Now, sort of a Cain and Abel reference there, I think. Now, the Northman follows a broad generality of the story of Hamlet. Or is it that Hamlet follows, in general, the basic story of Amleth? This is not an exact retelling of Amleth's tale from the Scandinavian sagas. But quickly, let's get the historic context correct. By the early 8th and 9th centuries, the Danes, which co collectively included the, the Danes from Denmark, the Norsemen from Norway, Swedes from, well, you guessed it, Sweden, and the Geats from southern Sweden, ravished Britain and France, raiding up and down the coast of Britain and entering the Seine River all the way down to Paris. Now this was a period where the Danes conducted many raids, or as some would say, they went Viking. While the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes from what is now Denmark and Northern Germany conquered the island of Britain in a relatively short amount of time, these Germanic tribes converted to Christianity and founded kingdoms. As a result, Northern Europe saw the most significant period of peace and stability since the fall of the Western Roman Empire, with many vowing allegiance to the Pope in Rome at the end of the 8th century. Now, with the arrival of the Vikings age in the year 793, now this period of peace came to an end. The monks of Lindisfarne who were enslaved after the monastery was pillaged. A quick aside, the Northmen were essentially paid by the Franks to leave them alone after laying siege to Paris in 845 CE. Later, in around 911 CE, Rollo, a Northman, was given the area now known as Normandy to rule as a duchy. Now after a while, the Normans from Normandy in 1066 conquered England. So if you're new here, we cover the film genres of sci-fi, horror, action-adventure, prop culture, and all things geek. So if you want more videos like this, 
Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to be aware of all my new videos. Our story takes place in the area around 900 CE in southern Scandinavia. I'm not sure exactly where, as everywhere up there looks gray and gloomy, hostile and isolated. Sounds like Norway to me. Now, Mount Hecla, a real Icelandic volcano, is seen in the op opening shot. However, it is not where the story begins, but, in fact, where this tale will end. Now, the name Hecla literally translates to Hell's Gate. And, as we see throughout the film, it grows more and more active as our main character's revenge quest progresses. And the film's narrative explicitly states that a prince destined for Valhalla will seek vengeance. Now, we see two ravens in the snowstorm, which is a fitting visual given that Amla's father, King Arvindville, is known as the War Raven, and the king's demise is foreshadowed by the terrible weather. And the ravens serve as a sort of guide for Amla's on his quest. Now, ravens were also utilized by the Norse god Odin to deliver information to him. Therefore, Odin is watching over Amla, who is eagerly anticipating his father's arrival. Amla is young and lives in this fairy tale life with his noble father, adoring mother, and loyal kingdom. And when the king arrives, you get the impression that he's loved and respected. So people kneel in front of him and give him gifts. However, one person does not accompany the king on his triumphant ride from battle into town. Instead, at the welcome celebration, his brother seems kind of pissed off. Now, with a necklace plucked from the dead body of a rival prince's neck, Arvadil presents it to his son as a gift. Now, Amleth will keep the medallion as a memento of his father till he's grown up. It's a bit ironic. It was taken from a dead prince. Weird, huh? A prophetic and, and ironic, don't you think? When Hyamur the Fool tells a crude joke. Now, this is the first hint that this fairy tale life isn't what it appears. The jest Hyamur makes is regarding Queen Gurudin's proclivity for being a tease. Now, the king is unconcerned, as that's exactly what fools or jesters should do. However, the king's brother becomes enraged. The funny thing is that this interaction hints in this version that goes far beyond the traditional story of who the queen really is as a person. Now, the king is dying due to a liver wound that is slowly killing him. As a result, he brings his son to a magical rite to prepare him for maturity. He takes on the characteristics of a wolf, something primordial, a raw, that will, a raw essence that will become a part of his persona throughout his life in the movie. Now, think of the cave scene from Altered States with Henban seeds used as hallucinogenics instead of peyote or mescal mescaline. Now, he must make a promise to protect his family and revenge his father if he dies in battle. Endless cries and tears are collected by the fool, who also is a shaman, who declares that this is the last time he will shed tears until he needs them. Later in the film, a Cirrus will return these tears to him as an adult. It's also here that we see the cosmic tree Yggdrasil. Again, think of the MCU's Thor and the tree that binds the nine worlds together. Now, to Amleth, it also represents his family tree displaying his royal lineage. But his reunion with his father is cut short when his father is shot by arrows as they emerge from their ritual. Now, the assailant and his father's brother are close by. They're just coming down the street, coming down the road, essentially. Now, watching his father struck down by his uncle, Fjellnor, the horrified kid runs and fights for his life, even chopping off the nose of one of his assailants, who would later inform the new king that the young prince is dead. Now, he swears to save his mother, get revenge for his father, and reclaim his country. But after a few years, the vow is forgotten, and Amleth, who was taken in by another kingdom, is now an emotionless, animalistic berserker who conducts deadly raids to acquire slaves for feuding countries. Now, for decades, the Northmen, primarily Swedes, cruised down the rivers of Eastern Europe, raiding and extracting payment from villages along the river. They were referred to as the Varangians, and they ruled the, uh, the medieval state of Kievan Rus. They established the Rurik dynasty, which ruled in some areas of Russia for 21 generations, or for 700 years, ruling over a loose confederation of Slavic and Finn peoples. Yes, this is the start of Ukraine and Russia. Early in the film, there is a scene where the raiders are rowing along a river, 
and as they come along a village, they sack and plunder it. They are led by a woman. So if you ever watched the History Channel's Vikings, they depicted women in much the same way. Now, as a matter of fact, we get both the Ragnar Lothbrok and the Amleth stories from the same collector. Saxo Grammaticus, circa 1150 to 1220 uh, CE, a Danish historian, theologian, and author of the Gesta Danorum, the first compiled history of, the De of Denmark, or the Danes, where we get this legend. While a Dane himself, he wrote the Gesta Danorum in Latin and in a particularly ponderous style. Sort of how H.P. Lovecraft crafted his stories, using arcane words instead of more concise ones. The thought is that if it was indeed William Shakespeare who reimagined Amleth into Hamlet, he may have heard it through a French or even English translation. Now there is much violence and death that takes place, and there is much death and destruction still going on in Ukraine today. Now the director, Robert Eggers, summed up this portion of Amleth's story with a reference to The Lion King. This is the Hakuna Matata part of The Lion King, only with a lot more killing and blood. Now Björk, the, uh, the Cirrus, realigns Amleth's fate after the sacking of the Rus village. However, Amleth is haunted, not by his father's ghost as Hamlet is, but by the legacy he inherited from his father, by the mythology he ta was taught as a kid. By the way, Björk is metaphysically, shamanistically weird. When he discovers that the slaves from the raid were promised to his uncle Fjolnir, he decides to cut his hair and brand himself as a slave himself. So just like Maximus Decimus Meridius, he wants a chance to be delivered to his enemy free of charge. But wait, his uncle has lost his kingdom to Harald Fairhair, who unified Norway in the late 800s and early 900s. So where are his uncle and his mother now? Iceland. Now, of course, this is the part where the two beautiful people in the film get to meet and form a relationship. Olga, who knows that Amleth is not a sheep, but a wolf, meets up in a boat sailing for Iceland. They form an alliance, not out of necessity, but more out of love for each other. And by the way, she is kind of a witch. When Amleth enters the king's quarters, he is shocked to, be, to discover that his mother is now married to his uncle. A stunning revelation. Not only that, but he now has a half-brother. Amleth stealthily slips away into the night where ravens lead him to a cave where a he-witch guards the rotting skull of the fool slain by Fjolnir. He cut the tongue out of the fool before he killed him. See what you get for saying stuff about the queen? Now the fool is played by Willem Dafoe. Like Ethan Hawke, they don't have a significant parts in this film and very little screen time, as by the first part of the first act, they're dead. But their performances and presence leave a lasting impression on the audience. The foe's mummified head seems to be staring at you as the wizard prophesizes to Amleth that he must take the sword from the king from under the mountain. Which he does by going to the gates of hell and, like any good mystical story, must vanquish the king in what seems to be a battle. Or did he? The use of psychedelics in this movie is mind-blowing. But one is never really sure if it is metaphysical or not. While as a slave to his uncle, he and Olga form a plan to wreak spiritual, no, scratch that, say psychological havoc on his uncle. His mother, his cousin, who was but a baby the day his father died, and unfortunately, his half-brother. Amleth, not wanting to let on his true intentions, plays the fool. Amleth, it turns out, in Old Nordic, does mean fool. Now, I don't want to give too much away, however, I want to comment on the pagan superstition beliefs fueled by psychedelics and that Alma's father ingrained into his son a sense of legacy, a sense of family, and a sense of destiny for those he loved. Where in the cave with the he-witch, he is told that you must choose between kindness for your kin and hatred for your enemy. Now, remember, this is a tragedy, and Amleth is a tragic hero. He must make a choice for himself and for Olga. Now, Anya Taylor-Joy, as Olga, shows that she can carry a scene and is not only Amleth's inspiration, she is also somewhat of the brains behind the brute. As an actor, she brings humanity to the film. Yes, she is plotting with Amleth, but I'm not sure whether or not it's her genuine desire to free the slaves or her love for Amleth which makes this even more tragic. She also has the same Russian accent as in 
the New Mutants. Nicole Kidman is excellent in her portrayal of a wife and mother in a world and time when life was cheap and a woman was usually good for one thing, having male heirs. She knows how to survive. She plays Gudrun in a way that is both believable and scary. Kidman plays the queen so that you have no doubt that there is something very wrong with her. I think the gods will be good to Nicole when the Oscars come around. I like Nicole Kidman. Do you? And Alexander Skarsgård. I don't know if playing Tarzan was a rehearsal for this role going from an ape's in internal beast essence to the wolf's shamanistic totem. Still, he really pulls it off with the pure frightening animalistic character he brings out in Amleth. Alexander Skarsgård gives a fantastic performance in this film. You felt he was the character and you felt for him. And as a Swede and a producer in this film, I am sure this movie is close to his heart. Now, could Skarsgård? replace Chris Hemsworth in an upcoming Thor film? Now, in my opinion, Robert Eggers has a disturbing vision of humanity on one hand and hopefulness on the other. The blending of color, scenes, the music, action, and the brief interludes of character development help ground the film and the audience in the story. In addition, he pulls dreamy, mystical scenes that seem to have been ripped from the Norse mythology's past. Now, Yaren Blaschke, the cinematographer who creates a gory, muddy, gorgeous and sometimes strange vision is fantastic in filming the battle scenes and the epicness of the framing of the stars. However, the funny thing is that one doesn't see much gore on the battlefield. Yes, you see the sword hacking, but ultimately the kill usually appears off screen in many scenes. Robert Callahan and Sebastian Gainsborough's musical score is essential in setting the mood of each scene. The epic string section conveys the king's majesty and the grandeur as he returns from war, and the percussion is so deep. The booming score will make you want to howl and beat your chest and join in with an on-screen ceremony on multiple occasions, and that sense of ritual will pervade the rest of the film. Now with Olga now on the scene, going into the film's second half, Eggers introduces a romantic flavor with a mysterious and somewhat supernatural undertone. However, as the movie progresses, the musical score becomes less important. The film is not for everyone. It is violent. It can be ugly, but also very, very beautiful. It's angry and it's sad. It's a tragedy. Now, The Northman does everything to immerse the viewer in familiar yet alien medieval landscapes, grounded in the physical world, while soaring into otherworldly regions that were inextricably linked to medieval Icelandic life. Here's your chance to take on a version of Hamlet without all the ponderance Elizabethan language that inflicts the King James Bible. Instead, the Northman is in a language that we as humanity still understand. Violence and destruction, hate and hope. I like the Northman. It will haunt me for some time. Now, the film is rated R and runs for about two hours and 17 minutes. Tell me if you saw the film and if you liked it or not. Tell me why. So if you liked the video, hit the thumbs up or slam the thumbs down if you didn't. Then subscribe and ring the bell to get notified when all my videos come out. And watch this video right here for more cosplay and film prop fun. Take care.